The number line or printer's key, often seen on the copyright page of books, is simply a method of record keeping that helps identify the book's printing and, for some, year of printing a specific book, which may or may not be different than the original copyright date listed elsewhere on the page. Common examples of these number pages include 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, or 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 93, 92, 91, 90, or 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, MPC, 19, 18, 17, 16, or even 1357910 while different publishers use different conventions for these number lines, generally speaking, the smallest number in the line indicates a book's printing. So if 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 is at the bottom of the page, it is a first printing. If the number 1 has been removed, so the number line is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, it is a second printing, and if it's 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, it's a third printing, etc. The reason they remove a number each time instead of, say, just changing one number has to do with the way publishers have historically printed books. For instance, in offset printing, you could relatively easily remove something from the printing plate, but adding a number would require creating a whole new plate. In any event, sometimes number lines are accompanied by the words first edition, but that does not necessarily mean it is the first printing. For example, this would indicate a third printing of a first edition. First edition 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There may be many printings of an edition, the latter of which may be defined as a single setting up of type without substantial change. So, if the author doesn't change the text of the book, like textbook authors frequently do, and the pages all stay the same, then if the publisher simply makes another round of copies, it isn't a new edition, it's just a new printing. If, however, the pages are substantially modified or the book is reformatted, such as for printing in paperback, then the printings in this new format will be a new edition. Note, though, that it may not be designated as a second edition or third or fourth, and instead may just be called a first paperback edition, or Penguin Classics First Edition. Serious collectors typically consider these last inferior to the cherished first edition, first printing. Depending on the publisher, the number line might also indicate the year that the printing was done, like 23456, 93, 92, 91, 90. This reveals that this second printing was done in 1990. Much like with the print run numbers, if the book is printed again the following year, the 90 would be removed, leaving the year part of the string as 93, 92, 91. Moreover, if the publisher contracts with an outside company to do the printing, that company may be indicated in the number line as well. In this example, the number line shows Melissa's printing company was hired to do a third printing in 2016. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, MPC, 19, 18, 17, 16. In in addition, some publishers prefer other kinds of lines. For example, Annis Publishing uses a number line that alternates its digits as 13579108642, where a second printing would read 35790108642, and a fifth printing would look like 5791086. This particular schema is used to keep the number line relatively centered over multiple print runs. Further demonstrating the lack of standardization across publishers for the printer's key, the publishing giant Random House has indicated its first edition, first printing, with the words first edition, but with a number line that begins with a 2, as opposed to a 1, such as 23456789, but it uses the same number, just without the words first edition, to indicate a second printing. Now for a bonus fact. Ever wonder why some pages are intentionally left blank? Well, one to know more. To begin with, the practice of marking intentionally blank pages with some form of intentionally blank goes all the way back to the dawn of automated printing itself, where mistakes in printing were relatively common. Like today, the main purpose of marking these pages in this way was simply to make sure that people knew the blank page wasn't the result of a printing error. Given this, it's no surprise that you'll almost always only see this text on pages that you might otherwise think shouldn't be blank given their position in the written work. This brings us around to the much more interesting question of why any pages are left blank in the first place. After all, this is a waste of paper and potentially a lot of money given the print volume of some tests, pamphlets, books, etc. 
As for the first on that list, in timed tests, an intentionally blank page is often used as a shield of sorts to stop wily students from trying to read the next section's questions before they're supposed to. To make sure that no student is confused about a random blank page in their test, they simply indicate on the page some form of the somewhat contradictory statement, this page is intentionally left blank. Alternatively, they might put something like stop here instead so the student knows to wait until the next time section starts and that the page is mostly blank for a reason. Another reason to include a blank page, particularly in certain official documents, is to avoid ink from a pen potentially bleeding through to another section of the document. This is also one of the reasons you may sometimes encounter otherwise blank pages saying something like, do not write anything on this page. In both cases, the page is there simply to prevent processing errors due to ink bleed. Blank pages in books and other bound works, on the other hand, are generally there because these works are often created by folding single, large sheets of paper in very specific ways. And and binding them all together. This group of pages is known as a signature and might include something like 4, 8, 16, or 32 pages out of a single large sheet. Regardless of how the paper is folded, the end result is going to be a book or a booklet with an even number of pages. If you look carefully at the spine of a book you have lying around, you may even be able to see this sort of grouping of pages if you let it flare open a bit. So, for example, if the content of a book fills 299 pages, the layout artist might choose a signature of four, thus a minimum of 75 folded sheets, making up 300 total pages. This would, of course, include one blank page. On the somewhat extreme end, if the signature comprises 32 pages, so 10 folded sheets, making up 320 pages, you'll have a whopping 21 blank pages, making this signature signature likely a poor choice here, though there still might be financial or technical reasons to use it anyway. Of course, savvy editors or layout artists tend to try and tweak formatting to help the book fit the chosen signature while minimizing needed pages. But inevitably, there's going to be times when nothing can be done and there will be a blank page or pages. In this case, they might resort to tricks such as putting advertisements about some of the other works of the author or publisher in the book. Alternatively, they might put a short biography about the author rather than have it somewhere on the cover. Or, if necessary, they might move such a biography to the cover to save space within a book. Alternatively, they might indicate the blank pages are for the reader to take notes in, particularly in textbooks. All of these tricks are basically ways of avoiding a random blank page, or in some cases, needing to put something like, this page is left intentionally blank in the book. Nevertheless, you'll still occasionally see this text in some bound works. Again, in these cases, generally only put there in cases where the editor in question thinks the reader might think the page was not supposed to be blank. So, for instance, you may have noticed that many books have a blank page at the start or end or both. This is a safe bet not to confuse anyone, so it's a handy way to mask that the book's content didn't quite fit the signature without needing to put, this page is intentionally left blank. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that thumbs up button below. Do not forget to subscribe. Brand new videos every day of the week. Also, for more from me, why not check out my podcast? It's called The Brain Food Show. If you search Brain Food, one word, you are going to find that show wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, thank you for watching.